You're listening to the Finding Careers End podcast. I'm your host, Pete Newsom, and my guest today is Casey Jaycox. Casey is a sales and executive leadership coach and also the author of the book, Win the Relationship, Not the Deal. He's also host of the Quarterback Dadcast, and he's an outside coach for Limitless Minds. Casey, you're a pretty busy guy. How are you today? I'm doing good. Thanks for the opportunity to join your show. Excited well, to be here. Thanks for finding the time. I, I have to say, um, I'm just going to confess this to you up front. I'm, I'm a little intimidated. Uh oh, you can. Yeah, which you can is not normal. Press, you can you can bench press more than me. You shouldn't be intimidated. <laughs> it's, it's a little, and and I'm intimidated because you're significantly better at this than I am, and I know that firsthand because I was a guest on your podcast already. So um, so the bar the bar is pretty high. Oh, I don't know about that. You were a great, you were an easy guest. So I, I think that I should be intimidated because you made it so easy on me. Well, well, I'll take it, and we'll just we'll just congratulate each other and say how how wonderful each of us are. How's that? <laughs> I'll sign a ball for you. You sign a ball for me. Perfect. Perfect. Well, um, how, how's life uh, out in Seattle right now? We're healthy. We're, we're busy. We got kids. Um, my son just wrapped up his sophomore season in golf. My daughter is getting ready to ramp up her summer of AAU basketball. Um, I am hopefully I'm preparing for my own golf season. Um, I am enjoying this entrepreneurial journey that I'm on and, um, just wake up wake up. I, every morning I start with gratitude and just thankful to be alive and get a chance to compete and get better each day. Well, I, I, you know, was so interested when we first spoke that you seem to have so many things going on, um, in addition to being a, a very active father. And, and I think one of those, um, you know, one of the things that you're very involved in, you know, has to do with being a dad. So let, mm -hmm. let's start with that. If, if you don't mind and talk sure. about the podcast and you know, what's the story behind that and your, your purpose for starting it in the first place. Yeah. I, so I, I ran a internal podcast at K force before I left back in March of 2019. And then I knew I wanted to start a podcast. Well, I wasn't sure what it was going to be. I knew I want to do something around dads. And then I thought, Oh, I, should, I think quarterback dad cast something about being a quarterback, a leader of a team, kind of like the leader of your home. I thought there was a metaphor we could play. And my, my good buddy a guy named Ty Nunez, who is my, one of my best receivers I played with at central Washington, Uncle Rico moment right there. Um, he, uh, he, he literally came to my house one time and said, let's work. I'm coming over. We're going to get this thing going. And he, we just, he kind of kicked me in the ass. And next thing I know, I, you know, had about 10 episodes recorded and then I launched it and I look back now we got, we're in season three. I got episodes booked through August right now. Um, oh, wow. Nice. Two sponsors. And, but the goal is really, it's selfishly for me. I get free therapy out of every dad I talk to. Uh, the goal is for me to share openly my gaps, my challenges, things I'm working on as a dad, because we all have them so that we become more relatable, whether you're the CEO of Four Corner Resources, the former rep at K-Force to Rick Riz, the man, you know, Mariners play-by-play -play guy to um, Michael Gervais, who's Pete Carroll's business partner to anybody, right? I've interviewed a lot of really cool people, but in the end, we're all dads and our kids could give to, you know what, what our job is. They just, is, does dad love me? Does he, is he teaching me how to do things? And, and for me, it's, it's just so fun. Like, you know, like we're having a conversation today, it's, you know, but it, but with the, the microphone, the headset are making us have it. And, and my goal out of my podcast is to get dads to open up, not just about the sports and weather. Like yeah, some, and it, yeah. It's and you have, and you find time to do that as a result of the podcast. Yeah. You think yeah. it would be something that we would do naturally because it is so appealing. We get so much out of conversations that have some depth to them, but I rarely have those those kind of interactions with people. It's hard to find time to do it. So there's some irony there and probably something that uh, a psychiatrist or psychologist should study is that we're having these conversations in a work forum, so to speak, and they're, they're more meaningful than most of the social conversations we probably have throughout the week. Right? Yeah, totally. And it's a reminder to slow down. It's a, it's a reminder that, you know, those, if there's dads listening, you, that sand in the hourglass is just speeding up. I mean, I can't believe I, my son just turned 16 and got his license recently. And I'm like, holy hell, how did that happen? You know, my daughter's like, I'm gonna have two kids in high school next year. Well, it's, it, it happens and it's cliche, but we all seem to experience that same realization too late that it, it, it flies by. My oldest just graduated from college and talk about a weird feeling. 
you know, mm-hmm. where I could always say, well, I'm not old yet because of, you know, my kids are still in school and now I have my, my child is an adult and that's, that's hard to reconcile for me. Totally. <laughs> I don't feel old enough um, to have an adult child. Yeah. So you mentioned something I do want to jump on and, and, you know, I want to get back to the, the podcast a little bit, but you've been extremely successful in your career. You uh, were at K-Force for, I believe, 19 years. Is that just, yeah, just shy 20. You were their number one sales rep. And for anyone who's not familiar with K-Force, I certainly am because they're a staffing company, but one of the largest that exists, a multi-billion dollar company. And you were their number one rep consecutive years, which is, which is a really impressive claim to, it is something you know, that is a significant achievement. I mean, I have a deep appreciation for that. Do you think your kids realize how successful that you you were or are still? I mean, do, do they do they have any appreciation for that? I think they know that dad did a few things in his job. I, I don't ever talk to him about it. Um, they have no. They know that dad has a podcast. They know that dad wrote a book. I think that's kind of cool. Um, they don't ask a lot of questions um, as they're getting older. Like my son starts to understand, but I, I want, I, I think it'll be more impactful for my kids when they ask me questions um, versus me saying, Hey, let me tell you how cool your dad is. Cause they'll be like, you're a tool. No, thanks. <laughs> well, they are, they are at that age, right? Yeah. They'll come around eventually, but you rose, well, you, you did a few things to you in that 19 years that without even asking you, what, what I know you had to have done was to walk a minefield through a, a corporate setting where someone like me, my mouth is way too big to ever not make the wrong person mad, say the wrong thing at the wrong time. I mean, it really does take a special skill to do that. And you were, you, you rose through the ranks, you to, to a very high executive level with a very successful large company mm-hmm. after you were already achieving that success, uh, the sales success. So what, what do you attribute that success to along the way? Um, my parents, my coaches, instilling humility. And um, I learned the power of the word vulnerability through a massive injury I had in, in high school, which prevented me from playing Division One or, or bigger Division One to play football. Um, I broke my foot in um, four spots. I didn't play football my senior year in high school. I beat out a kid who was more athletic than me my junior year. I had a pretty good junior year. And then I went to a couple of camps, went to the University of Washington camp, won an award that I did not anticipate winning. The next thing I know, I'm on their recruiting radar. This is back in 1993. And the last play of our jamboree, which is, for those who don't know, it's like a mini practice games before the real season starts. And I, I remember I, get, I got put in for the last play for whatever reason, passing play. Still remember it, Lee Wright, 90 Reed. And uh, snap came a little slow, nose tackle, dove through the gap, pinned my on top of my shoe, I couldn't move. I got into a catcher stance. Defensive end came around, blast me. I felt like the tongue of my shoe flew off. Wow. Broke four bones immediately. Um, was in surgery two hours later. World goes on. World moves on. The guy that beat out my junior year who's going to play tight end, he now has to play quarterback. I'm a captain. I'm sure not acting like because I'm feeling down. I'm selfish. I'm hoping he plays bad deep down. I didn't want that. It was all about me. I was selfish. I was 17. Uh, Pete, he went on to set our single season passing yardage record. He took us to the state playoffs first time in 20 years. And he was named second team all league quarterback. And I had to watch. None of which made you feel better. No. The opposite, right? No. But what the, the beauty of the story that I get inspiration from every time I tell it is about three games into the season, I, I finally went to my coach and I said, coach, he's Marty Osborne, still a mentor in my life today. I said, I'm embarrassed by my behavior. He's like, what do you mean? I said, I'm, I'm a captain. I'm not acting like it. I'm so Shane's like teammate. I like him, but I want him to play bad because this is my team. I work so hard. I said, I just, I'm not, I need help. Like I just came from like, just asking for help. And he said, I'm so proud of you. I'm like, why are you proud of me? I didn't do anything. He's like, the fact you have the courage to come tell me all these things. This is awesome. I said, let's, you, how about, how about you? He's like, he looks around and goes, how about, how about you go up in the booth and, and you be my offensive coordinator. You know, this offense, offense better than I do. I was like, what? He goes, seriously, I want you to go up in the booth on game day and you be my offensive coordinator. I'm like, and immediately when he said that, it was like a vacuum sucked the energy out of me. And now I had purpose. I had clarity, which is why Coach Osborne is such an amazing leader. That moment, I think it prepared me for, yeah, so I was a great seller one year. Who cares? Get back in the huddle. Do it again. 
So I had a great another year. All right, you made a big play on third down. Get back in the huddle, do it again. That feeling of it can be taken away from me. And then as you know, in the staffing business, consultant, whatever, staff uh, consulting services, uh, in our world, we lose budget quickly, right? Yes. Client might lay off 50 contractors overnight. Great. What are you going to do? You throw two picks in the first half, get back in the huddle, do it again. That's right. All those mindset things I had to get really good at through repetition prepared me for that run at K-Force. So I knew, I knew the story of your injury from, and we, we bonded over that when we first connected and, and mm -hmm. our, our mutual friend, Patrick Surmeyer, who thought we should connect, um, you know, hit the nail on the head because my son who had you know, aspirations and a lot of potential to play college football at a high level, had back-to-back -back ACL tears and had to learn patience and deal with a lot of things that most kids in high school I would say probably shouldn't have to deal with and, and typically do not, but we know that there's benefit on the other, other side of that. What I didn't know of your story was one, how you, you know, turned it around and you had the, gosh, it, what is extremely unique mindset to you know, go to your coach and, 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 and acknowledge the way you were feeling, because I, I know that feeling. Yeah. You know, I, I will confess that as my son, Mm -hmm. was not able to play. I didn't cheer for the team quite as hard as I did before. Yeah, and totally. it, and I and I would sort of internalize that and say this you know that's that's an irrational feeling um but yeah, you know, I was there for you know, I wanted my son to have success, right? The fact that the team you know was succeeding was it was a distant second. But also the way your coach handled it, which is amazing because yeah. I think more often than not, I mean, well, I'll, I'll make an even stronger point. Almost every case, the, the player gets put on the shelf and forgotten about because your value to the team was what you could deliver on the field. That now isn't an option. And so um, you're not important anymore. You're irrelevant. Um, and, and I saw that happen with my son, and it, and it, and it hurt. It, it mm -hmm. pissed me off um, the, and because I couldn't do anything about it, right? I was frustrated. Right. And that coach to, to take that step. Wow. I mean, that's a, that's a really cool part of the story that I'm glad mm -hmm. you, you, you told because um, what an impact that had to have on your life. Oh, it's dramatic. I still talk to him to this day. I, I actually interviewed him on season one. If people want to find it. Coach Marty Osborne. He, he was a little, I'm going to put him on blast a little bit. He was a little chatty caffy. I bet he'd like to re-record and slow him down, but he was so amped up and excited. <laughs> but, but he, he was the reason. And one of the reasons I got to play in college, because he, he was a quarterback at Central Washington, 81, 82. And he said, this guy's got no film. Uh, he won this University of Washington football camp. They were on their radar. He's, a, he's an invited walk on UW. He doesn't want to go there. Uh, he wants to play. Uh, give him a shot. And I was like on 12th in the depth chart when I got there. And started chipping away, chipping away. Almost didn't redshirt my freshman year. Second year, which was my redshirt freshman year, I was um, on our 1995 national championship team. And uh, when we got him, John Kitna was our senior, our quarterback. Nice. And uh, and I split time my sophomore year with a guy named Ryan Fournier, who's a great friend to this day. I mean, that's another story. Ryan Fournier was a fifth year starter, fifth year guy. Wow. Waited five years to play. And I get there and I chip away at a starting job. So he waits five years. And all of a sudden, a skinny little punk comes in halfway through. The I, I come off the bench in the second quarter and, and throw for 333 and four touchdowns. And we were down 28, six, we get in the shootout and Ryan Fournier was one of, on my book launch team. He's a successful CEO of insurance company. Um, and then I was able to start tough years, but I guess the reason I'm sharing all this stuff, all these journeys that we go through in life that people that you're probably your audience are going to go through when, when challenge happens, when adversity happens, don't say, Oh, what was me say? Wow. Yes. This happened to me. Let's find for the positive. Let's let's seek. Because it always, there's always a silver lining if you, if you look for it. It's not always fun, but it's, you can. Well, it's incredibly difficult to see it in the moment. Much easier with hindsight, much easier with age. Uh, you, you probably have some opinions uh, on the transfer portal and what that's done for college football, where these kids who are you know, almost without exception the star of their team, probably the star from every field they've played on up until the time they go to college, and then they're just one of many and they're not equipped for it. And now the, you know, the NCA has offered them uh, just an easy pass, right? Things don't go your way. 
just go somewhere else. What, what yep. do you think about that? I, I don't like it at all. So I'll tell you, that's my feeling. But I, I didn't have to live it uh, that life myself. But what do you think is the next college? I, I think it, um, I'm sure there's use cases why it makes sense. Um, I definitely don't want to pass judgment to families going through it because I don't know what it feels like to be them. But from an outsider perspective, um, I think it sends the wrong message. I think it says you can quit and go someplace else with, with there's adversity. I think even like I think about the guy, kid from Oklahoma that went to USC. I mean, starting at Oklahoma, he's going to go to USC. I think it's, it's ridiculous. Um, why am I blanking on the guy's name, the, the Pats Patriots quarterback who came from Alabama? I know you're talking about, but I'm not going to come up with it right now. I'm blanking. But his story is what I love. The why the transport, like he could have easily transferred. This kid backed up Tui. He backed up Jalen Hurts, waits five years, and then lights the NCAA on fire his senior year, crushes it, does all these amazing things. And he, and that's why he's had such a good NFL season. Sure. Yeah. Um, I just don't think it sends the right message. Um, well, you know, and I, I think it impact high school recruiting because now colleges college coaches are going that's the recruiting there instead of colleges high schools i mean no, no doubt and i think it's um it's it's consistent with a lot of things today that that aren't necessarily good for for young people and good for society as a whole because you don't learn what i consider to be extremely valuable lessons of patience and and climbing the mountain um you know it when success of any kind comes easily in my opinion or my experience, you tend to think you're smarter than you are, better than you are. You don't you don't learn nearly as much as in, as when you know you have to overcome adversity, you have to fight you know, to win. Um, I think of it as achievement, and mm -hmm. and I think happiness, you know, comfort, success ultimately requires some sense of achievement, right? Mm -hmm. Where when it's handed to you, it, it just lacks meaning. And, and I, and I say that a lot. I think I've already said it. I think I may have said that on the last um, interview I did because it, I, I do think about that often and it's applicable. We're talking about college football now, uh, but you can apply that to almost any scenario that, that exists in life. So it's, yeah. I mean, think about a sales job. So you, you have, you get hung up on, Oh, okay. I'll go to a different company. Well, they're going to hang up on you over there too. You, no one's going to give you the best account to make $6 million day one. Like, you got to go earn it and anything that's given to someone too easy, it's never going to last. Uh, it might look good from the outside, but once that wind blows, the house is going to fall down. Absolutely. You know? <laughs> so, well, so you, you, you mentioned vulnerability, you mentioned uh, you know, the, the struggles you had to go through that, that made you, um, you know, prepared for sales, but it, there had to be more than that. I mean, you were you know, quite literally, at the top of, of your game and a game that is extremely competitive, not only internally, but externally. Um, anything else you could share on, on what you think led to that? Because I, I, you know, that, that, that makes you unique. You know that. I appreciate that. I, you know, I am, um, I think it go, I'll go back to just sports. I never, my college football coach said, K Casey, if you have to tell in life, if you have to tell people how good you are, you're not that good. When you're great, they'll tell you. And that one always hit home for me. And I just, I never wanted to be the arrogance a-hole a that no one wanted to be around. I wanted to be like one of the strongest in the weight room, but no one knew it. Uh, when people met me like, oh wait, you're, you're Casey? Like I was expecting like someone totally different. And I'm like, why? Like, we're just dudes. We're just normal people. Like I got gaps just like you do. And I think that I, go, I got more inspired by the word humility. I get goosebumps talking to you about this. Like I get more ins inspiration from humility and just creating environments where people aren't afraid to share where their gaps are. Sure. Um, it just makes it more fun. It makes it more for a culture tight. Um, and I think about like just the, the grit of the grit and the competition always love, you know, motivated me, which is probably why I'm having so much fun right now in this new world I'm in now. I love the, the thrill of a deal, the thrill of winning a person, like winning a relationship, not a deal. When you win people, you got them for life, right? That I love that feeling. And so, um, you know, staffing is a very commodity, you know, a commodity based business, yep. but I used to always challenge myself. It doesn't have to be, I, I can, I can tell myself those things or I can prove that it's not. And when you differentiate yourself and you do the little things, like I read about in my book, I think that's why I had, had the run that I did and, and why I sustained the level I did through the ups and the downs. Yeah, I'm sure there's other industries like staffing, but 
uh, in our in that world, you're we all have the same product, right? There's there's nothing unique about that because we we all have the potential to offer the same the same candidates. You know, price is rarely a factor. Uh, the market sets that. We we don't. Um, so it really does come down to the individual and the relationship that person's able to develop. I mean, this is sort of a you know, a sophomore way to say it, but I, I you know, said for years, it, it, it comes down to, you know, who you like, who you trust, and, and who you're used to working with. I mean, it's mm-hmm. sort of, you know, as simple as that at times, but you know, liking who you work with and trusting them is not something that, um, you know, we should gloss over because mm-hmm. it has to be earned and it has to be maintained. And once lost, it can never, you can never have it again. And so I, you know, I know you had to have those things in place, but I suspect after a couple interactions with you at some depth that um, I, I think you're a pretty disciplined, regimented guy too. I, I would guess. I, I bet there's Very there's good, not, yeah. there's not. I bet you didn't go into a week unprepared ever. If I was betting, yeah, that's accurate. I it's funny. One of the and I write about this in the book. And the I wrote a chapter about doc, documentation, which is most salespeople. I say that word and I say CRM. They get they get anxious, They're like, ah, I don't like CRMs. And I'm like, and either you can be one of those sell, sellers who uh, you can be one of those sellers that, that says these bad things about CRM or just embrace it. And for me, I think getting, you know, getting those habits down of remembering to document, doing the little things each and every time, um, showing up prepared, not winging it, pra- making practice important, um, understanding clients' needs, um, documenting where they went to college, all, all the things that like are choices, but you know, the old Tommy Lasorda baseball Dodgers, he said, there's three types of people in life, people who wonder how things happen, watch things happen or make things happen. And Love I was it. always someone that I'm, I'm going to make it happen. And I remember one of the guys I worked with, he's like, Jake, I like a freaking robot. You just, you know, you, that's, that's what, yes, that's what I'm picturing, you know, yeah. but to me, it was like, you know, I like when someone says they don't have time, I'm like, wow, you might, that's, I'd love to hear more about this because last time I checked, God gives us all 1,440 minutes each day. It's up to us to how we use them. Isn't, isn't that the weirdest statement? And it, it, I hear it a lot. I don't have time. And, and I always think, okay, I have four kids. I run, you know, two businesses. I, um, I, I, I watch a lot of TV. <laughs> I watch, I don't miss shows and series and movie. I go to movies a lot. I coach youth sports. Well, actually I can't, gotta stop saying that. I coached my final basketball game um, uh, uh, two weeks ago. So I won't talk about that right now. I'll get choked <laughs> up as, as you can appreciate. But uh, um, I have plenty of time and I know that I'm busier than, than most people. So I, it is the, the weirdest and worst excuse people give um, as far as I'm concerned. Anyway, yeah. I didn't mean to jump on that uh, too much, but uh, it's, it's, it's on my mind pretty often. And because I hear it so frequently that people don't have time to do whatever it is they probably should be doing, certainly don't want to do, and absolutely don't make a priority to do. Yeah. I think, you know, I talk about, um, five swear words in my coaching I do. And people think swear words like, you know, M F B S like the bad ones. I'm like, no, my swear words are need to, should to want to have to, and can't. There you go. Right. So need to, should to want to have to, and can't all those words do are create anxiety. Yes. There's no plan. There's no outcome. There's no vision. And so like I always, when I, when I say those words, I'm like, would you ever start a, would you ever get in a plane and the, and the captain, he or she, takes off and they look at each other. Hey, do you file a flight plan? Right? I'm like, no, I thought you did. Like, think about the nerves and anxiety you have on that flight. And like, yeah, I wouldn't be good. I said, that's what you're running your life and your business. You're flying, you're taking off without any game plan, any thought. And so for me, it's like, I, I simplify it by just saying either I will, or I won't. And I'm comfortable with both outcomes. And just focusing on simplifying it, right? Life is complicated enough. I'm, I'm going to simplify it and just the more I can get really clear on what's important to me and why it's important to me and, and where I want to go, life slows down. Well, it's safe to say you have a, uh, a level of self-awareness and again, discipline that, that most lack, right? And, and 
look, that's why we're talking here. I, I'm trying to find out through this podcast how success happens, mm-hmm. right? Because I think it hap- well, first, success is a very personal thing, and success mm-hmm. to you is you know, has a different than meaning what success is to me and everyone else. So it's a very intimate thing. But I believe there's a formula or so at least some some commonalities that, that come out. And, you know, what made you successful on the football field is what made you successful in sales. You're someone that clearly wants a ball in your hands because you're, you're, you're going to trust that you're going to do the things to get to the win. And I, I don't, you know, um, question that for a second. But... I could keep you here all day talking about that. So I want, I want to move on because I know uh, you do want to get to your kids eventually tonight. What oh, you walked away from that. You, mm-hmm. you left, you climbed the mountain that very few are able to climb and you took the chance to, um, which is a huge risk to, to not, you, you left the nest, so to speak, the comfort of that comes or the perceived comfort, I should say, because mm-hmm. I, as someone who also left, the corporate world, I, I would tell you it's not so comfortable at all since the catalyst for me leaving was mm-hmm. when my uh, 53-year-old VP of sales was reorged out of his job, and um, and it scared the hell out of me because I, I was 35 at the time and said, well, wait a minute, this that's what I'm aspiring to get to. And if it can happen to him because he was a wonderful guy who did everything right and was loved, he just... Yeah, the, he wasn't as good of buddies with the guys making the decision as, as the, other, the other ones were. And, um, so I know that's not really comforting at all at the end of the day, but you, you did that. And that's, that, that's a risky, scary thing to do. What, what led to that decision? You know, I'm very thankful. I left on great terms. Um, I think it came to a point where I did, you know, I was selling and then I moved into this leadership role. And at the end, you know, what the company wanted to do and what I was having fun doing, there really wasn't that role there anymore. And I always knew I wanted to write a book but I knew I didn't want to write the book when I was still at K4 because I didn't want to, I didn't think that was fair to them to make that a distraction. So I just kind of kept it in the back of my mind. And I thought maybe this is the time, you know, I've, I spent a long time there and I had, I always liked being, you know, the weakest in the weight room or, or, or the dumbest in the room. I wanted to be surrounded by like just people that made me like uncomfortable. And I was striving for that. And um, not to say that K4 didn't, I just was looking for something, a, challenge and you know thankfully that like i said i left on great terms and i i knew that this book was the next challenge and then this podcast was the challenge and and then i didn't anticipate you know enjoying those as much as i did and then one day coaching found me which i did when i left in k-force i didn't say hey i'm gonna be a coach coaching found me and people started reaching out i'm like they're like hey do you coach i'm like yeah my kids (laughs) and i'm like no, like you coach businesses. I'm like, well, it's not only not what I do. I'm not certified. And I was hung up on that for some reason. And I had a great call with a guy named Andrew Moss from Toronto. I called him one day who I met through this entrepreneurial journey. And I said, Hey, I've been getting these companies that ask me if I coach, but I'm, I'm not certified. What do you think I should do? He goes, can I be honest with you? I said, yeah, man. He's like, no, I'm going to be really, really honest with you. I said, I played uh, college football. I've been coached hard. I've been in executive boardrooms. I've been on earnings calls. Give it to me. I can take it. He's like, Okay, so what I've, what I've heard about you is you've done blah, 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 all these things. He lists them all. He goes, I want you to get out of my mother effing face and go help people. Stop wasting my time. You wrote a book about it. Seriously, this is a joke. Get out of my face. And I was just like, okay. And like right there, I just boom. And I didn't look back. I called, the, I called my first client back. I said, hey, I know you say you're looking for a coach. I'm your guy and here's why. And told her and she's like, yeah, you're right. Let's go. You're hired. Yeah, that, 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 that imposter syndrome, you have to overcome it, right? Yeah. Um, which is self-imposed in your case, yeah. clearly, because you did achieve all the things that um, others can benefit from. But uh, with the book, what would, you, so you thought about doing that for a while, it sounds like, before you actually decided to take the plunge. Can, mm-hmm. Give us a quick overview of, of what the book is about. Yeah, the book idea came to me when I was traveling to Dallas and I was opening up one of our larger accounts. They were kind of expanding throughout the United States and uh, I remember the younger folks were always so eager, eager. I was like the big brother. They wanted to make me happy and help me and, and, and make me earn my trust for, or earn their, like their attaboys. And they were wrapped up in every single deal. And I said, I want you to expect to win every deal, but be okay with, you're not going to win every deal. I'd rather see you win the person. So how can you win the person when you lose the deal? And they looked, looked at me like, what are you talking about? And I was like, that's it. 
that's the name of the book, When the Relationship, Not the Deal. And <laughs> uh, yeah, and that's how I had it. And so when I left, um, when I decided to write, I wrote for like four months straight every day from nine to 1130. And I, and I thought about like, a, when I was selling at an elite level for a long time, what were the things I did? Like really tried to get down. I did a was word mapping exercise where I wrote down all these things. And then I just became clear, like I was, so there's six pillars or six chapters, which is, you know, starting the day when I enter the huddle, like quarterback, or if I enter the office, which is my huddle, do I bring positive, positive energy? Am I instilling truth, excitement? Do people want to be around me? Like that's like step one. Step two is expectation management, setting expectations internally, setting expectations or externally. When they, when I don't set expectations properly, I lose people's trust. Relationships get harmed. Chapter three is about the difference between listening and hearing. Hearing is subconscious. Listening is conscious. It takes very focused effort. Listening, I'm now all this data. Now what am I going to do with it? Well, chapter four is about documentation, writing it down, setting next activities, using the whatever I learned from a customer to use to talk about the next time we speak. Um, chapter five is about then ditching your ego, being authentic, being vulnerable to, to realize that we aren't all perfect. No matter how, if I was the number one or not, don't matter. We all got gaps. And then chapter six is about relationships take time and patience and you have to persevere through the ups and downs and then the last like chapter seven i kind of tie in personal examples um i actually wrote wrote about my dad before he passed it was, it was called you know i think that same theme of you know when the not the so it was um when the when the when the relationship with my dad not the dementia mm. and, and then there was you know when the when the marriage not the boat launch for all the people who who backed down boats before know the stress of that Yes. And my wife, my wife's just better than that. I mean, so I, I own that. <laughs> and then the last one was, you know, win the, um, win the athlete, not the outcome of the game. Yeah. I, you mean the, the chapters as you're, as you're listing them, I mean, it sounds like the sales Bible to me where, you know, if, if you can follow those things and I say, if, because it's so much easier said than done, uh, you know, to be patient, uh, I've, um, Every salesperson I've ever hired and managed, they who who did not work out, they gave up on the opportunity and lost you know, patience or confidence, however you want to phrase it, before I did because you know, I didn't I didn't become impatient with them because I know how long it takes and I know that if success in sales comes too quickly and easily, it's probably fleeting. It's it's probably not very meaningful and and you know to use the sort of a staffing example, uh, when, when a, a new salesperson goes out and, you know, makes one phone call and comes back with, with business, you know, jobs to fill, that scares the hell out of me, right? After one meeting, because mm -hmm. I'm like, wait a minute, what, why would they give those to you uh, right away? Right. That, that's, a, that's the biggest red flag I can think of, where most of the things, uh, the, the clients that, um, I've done the most business with over the years took took years in some cases uh, to, to get into because if they're going to let you in you know, quickly, they're going to let everyone else in quickly. We, we know that. But um, how, how, how do you, do you have any way, and I don't want you to give up the secrets of the book because I'm, I'm telling you right now, I'm going to order it for, for my team, uh, oh, I've got a copy for everyone because just those chapters alone to me, like I said, tell what needs to be learned. But if you wouldn't mind sharing just some of that, I mean, how do you impart patience onto someone? How do you teach? I mean, it's something that I'll just be very open and say, I've given up trying to do mm -hmm. because it, you know by because I I don't think that's what that's in me. I, I don't I don't know how to do that. I just, mm -hmm. Nothing resonates with me in terms of how to do that. Um, mm -hmm. I just think you have to commit yourself to it, and it, it should be as simple as that. But clearly, it's not. So, any mm -hmm. any thoughts that you could share? Yeah, I think like, so patience is, it's kind of like, you, it's a mindset shift. You have to tell yourself it, like exactly what you just said. If, it, if it's given to me too easy, it wasn't worth it. And like, I tell very personal stories of failure. I talk about, um, you know, winning the largest deal, in, one of the largest deals in K4 history to one of the largest flunks. Neither was really my fault. I got either too much credit or too much blame. The client, VP of this client said, Casey, the day you won it, the day you lost it, you're the same guy. Thank you. Like that was probably the ultimate comp compliment I've ever got. Um, patience is, I think about the art of persuasion that I learned, meaning that if I try to convince you to do something, you're going to resist me. 
But if I ask great questions of value to make you realize how great my idea is, you're going to sell yourself. So a lot of it is, you know, I think curiosity is a superpower when used too often that I see this, the clients I'm working with from a coaching perspective, leaders are quickly to tell without asking questions to make sure they understand. Or like I follow the Socratic method, which if a, a rep came to me and asked me a question, I'm not going to give them the answer. I'm going to ask them a question back. Tell me what you think. We hired you for a person. I believe in you. Like, give me, take a guess, like make them think so that they begin to um, build these critical thinking skills, begin the op opportunity to be quote, you know, as a quarterback audible ready. So when things happen in front of the client, are you prepared? Are we instilling that practice is important? Or are we just saying, Hey, just make 500 phone calls a day, every day, and you'll be successful, which is false. That won't happen. Right. You're just teaching people bad habits. So I'd rather see people make 20 phone calls and then practice for two hours internally to get the right skills built so that when things get rocky, you know, they know how to handle themselves. Um, do, do you think, and I, and I, I, this is not uh, rhetorical in any way. I, I assure you, do you think you can teach someone to be a good salesperson or do they have to come you know, with those traits already ingrained at whether they're, uh, you know, they, they know it or not, whether they've ever come out, um, you know, is, is, do you have to have some it factor, do you believe, to, to be a successful salesperson or have a successful career in sales? That's a tough one. I, I, I'm naive in the fact that, you know, you know, my wife said you can't teach what you have. It's a gift. So I definitely am learning that. that I know I'm very blessed with skills I have. However, you can practice curiosity. You can practice listening. You can practice um, following up, you can practice understanding clients' business. You can practice, hey, the first they this is not about you. Like the first 10 minutes, do not talk about us. Like that, these are all things you can practice. So I, yeah, I think you can train salespeople because salespeople, unfortunately, sales has this connotation like, oh, you're in sales. Ugh. Like you need to go shower and brush your teeth. Like selling, <laughs> I've never sold a thing in my life. Clients sell themselves. My job is to like, what, what I strive for in every meeting I go on is, do I hear two words, which are great question, right? which I always say, I want to be the, the Maya Angelo of my industry. I want to be, it's not what I said, why I said it, but how I made you feel when we left an interaction. So I'm hopefully on your mind for a few hours. Like, man, that dude was different. He was present. Like, those are all things I think that can be taught over time if people commit to them. Or we don't choose patience and we say, well, I just got to get going. I got to, you know, and then you get transactional and then complacency sets in and then bad habits form. And then all of a sudden now you're on a performance plan. Next thing you know, you're like getting let go. Which we've both seen countless times, right? Yeah. I mean, you said it over time, commitment. Okay. Well, who goes into a job you know, now? I think this is, this is all back to the transfer portal comment, right? If things don't go your way and you can bail and we start setting that tone early. Um, I think it's an awful thing to do to young people. I think that's what that that's what bothers me about it. Mm -hmm. Right? I mean, because you don't get what you want, therefore, you give up and 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 quitting, especially it, it, now we're talking about sports again. I mean, what a conflicting message that is, right? And, and it just carries through it. it we, you know, we don't have enough time today. I'll get you back on later. And we'll, we'll talk about parenting and and, and how that leads yeah you know, that really sets the tone um although I, I i'm hesitant to give too much parenting advice while i still have you know until all four of mine are you know happy productive citizens of the world adding value you know uh, to society I'm, I'm i'm not gonna give too much advice on that so give me a few years there and i know you have a, a few to go as well but um I, you know it all is it's all kind of the same deal, isn't it? Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah. what, what, what works at home, what works on the sports team, what works in the office. And so if we set the wrong tone early, well, what do we expect is going to happen in mm -hmm. the professional world? I mean, do, do you see that trend in, in, in your coaching when you're working with clients? Is that a common frustration these days? And, and, and if, if, if so, it, it, and I assume it is, but I, don't, <laughs> I want to hear your answer. But and if so, is it is that something that, has changed over the last 20 years? I think, I think I'll answer it. Like, um, I think we are what we allow, you know, that and gets, that's parenting advice. That's leadership advice. If, if you're, if your culture sucks, well, it's probably on the leader. If your sales team has high turnover, it's probably on the leader. 
Yeah. If your sales team aren't asking a good question, probably on the leader, right? So what are we doing to like train and, and inspect? And so I think it is blaringly obvious to me. I said this a couple of times and I say it to every client I coach, we're not being curious enough. Right. I, I had someone I talked to earlier that is potentially going to talk to me about my services. She said, oh, my, my seller, she's, she's too curious. She has too many questions. I said, then why is she struggling? Uh, she's just, she, she's not listening. I said, no, she's, this is my opinion. She's struggling because you're not training her to ask the right questions. You're not creating a, an environment for practice so that she can get better at asking the right questions. Sure. The best sellers are always curious, always curious. So I think, you know, when teams can, can be create, remove fear to have, you know, humility and vulnerability to talk about their pipeline that might suck, that right. might be really bad, really full of garbage business. Do you have the, are you creating an environment where people can talk about that and say, man, I am embarrassed. My pipeline, I need boss, I need help. Or do you let them just, you know, fake it and have fluff. And then you, they just pretend it's going to be miraculously better. Fix itself. Which never happens. No, never does. Yeah. So I, I think, you know, that's why someone taught me that phrase, you are what you allow. And it always kind of stood. It's kind of like, I think about when younger kids, when parent, younger parents have young kids. And they'll say, oh, I can't go to dinner because my kids look, act like maniacs. Well, did they just decide to be maniac or do you allow that behavior at home? Yeah. And if whose you, fault is it right. if and when they do, right? Yeah. Teach them at your dinner table. Teach them, pretend you're at a restaurant. How will we act? Teach them the right manner so that when you go to a restaurant, you can do it. Yeah. It, and it, it really, it, it is all sort of the same mindset and approach, um, no, no doubt. And I love, I love the way you phrase that. So that's really, that's really good. It, it, you know, it's almost like you're kind of good at this, Casey, I have to say. <laughs> Someone joked at me, well, it's a lot of years of failure, a few years of success. Um, I was at my son's golf tournament and one of my mo buddy's moms, um, my son's buddy's mom, she's like, we were taught, we got, we had, I had a few soda pops in us. And she's like, you're like, you're like the Dalai Lama. <laughs> I'm like easy there turbo. No, I'm not. I have many gaps and that could be another whole episode of things I'm trying to work on to be a better version of me. Yeah. But you, 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 you know, you kind of are right. I mean, that's that, that, that resonates, um, you know, uh, pretty, pretty loudly. So if someone you know, was going to look at your coaching services, who, who would be a good candidate you know, for that uh, prospective client? Well, it's fine. If, if you had told me when I was at K first, I would have said, well, staffing companies, of course, so I'm working with wealth management advisors on relationship building. I've worked in insurance with insurance advisors. I've worked in real estate. I work in staffing. I work in management consulting. I've worked in uh, marketing services. Um, colleges have not hired me yet, but even though I think I could help teachers become better teachers of listening. I mean, the six components of my book, anybody who needs to build relationships in life can learn something from my book. And as the author, I've read it seven or eight times and I'm still learning from myself, which is kind of embarrassing to say. I think that's kind of cool to say um, yeah. that, that, that uh, you, because even though, well, is it, would it be fair to say though, that even though you know it, putting it in practice is, is something altogether different. We all need reminders. I wrote, I wrote the, the biggest, one of the biggest goals in my book is I wanted someone to reread it every year, every two years. Like, oh, have I forgotten to do that? Like that aha moment, like it was right in front of me. I got lazy. I got complacent and complacency is the silent killer to any thing we're good at. We get, com we get complacent. Yeah. That's so, so true. So, you know, I, I, I want to be sensitive to the time because mm -hmm. I know, you, you know your family wants to see you at some point and we could talk for a long, long time. And, you know, now that, now that I'm, I'm doing these longer interviews and deeper interviews, I can completely see why Joe Rogan can talk for three or four hours, right. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, get, and just get lost in the conversation because we've, we've covered, I haven't even asked you any of the questions that I had written down to ask you. So, um, Which is we'll good. have to do that a, a later day. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I will say that, you know, all, I, I don't want you to tell us where to buy the book and, and, uh, and, and find your coaching services. We're going to list all that in the show notes and whoever's okay. listening is probably walking or driving or running and not going to be able to write it down anyway. So we'll be sure to document all of that, um, cool. on the show notes, but I do want to just take a couple more minutes and talk about success as a whole and, and get your, um, get your thoughts on, you know, what is success to you? What is career success you know, to you? And has that definition evolved uh, over the years? 
I think, so this is probably a little dicey subject for some, I, I believe success is in balance. I think some people disagree with that, but I, I just, I believe success is balance. If I'm the best producer in the world, but a, pardon my French, you're gonna have to put an E next one, a shitty dad. Well, then that's not, that's not success. But if I'm a really, really good dad, but I'm horrible at my job, well, that's not success. So it's like in life, everything's moderation. So finding to be moderately, you know, be present is being successful. Um, building authentic relationships is being successful. Success isn't about like, yo, I made X. It doesn't matter. If I make X and I treat people horribly, that doesn't mean I'm successful. I think success to me is just, you know, being a good listener, being a good teammate, being a good husband, being curious on how you can serve others. I, you know, I teach people to have, but I go, <clears throat> sorry, <coughs> Ooh, wrong too. Success is having a boomerang mindset. Serve others, but don't keep score. Yeah, I let, well, that's 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 powerful. I'm gonna have to think about, about that a little bit because I haven't heard that phrase before. Um, but as you're talking, I'm thinking about that balance. You know, requires sacrifice. It requires, you know, may, may, maybe sacrifice consciously, maybe maybe unconscious, but. Uh, have you ever struggled with that where you say, well, I'm going to be a be, be present with my family because that's, I'm sure where you want to be, but consciously acknowledging and, and, and I say this, I'm, this is, this is me talking, right. And I think we have yep. some similarities as, as you know, professional salespeople, whatever we do today and whatever our titles are today, that that's who we are, whether we want to be or not. Um, but do you, do you ever think, I know I could be more successful professionally if I, if I didn't have that balance. Yeah. So like for me, my balance question for me was when my son Ryder was year and a half old, maybe year old. I was, I was getting home. I was leaving at like six 30, six 15. So he wasn't up yet. And I was getting home at six 30, six 45 and he was going to bed at seven. So I was getting 15 minutes a day as a dad. Yep. I'm like, this is not what I signed up for. And I remember I went to my boss, shout out to Angela Ronica, if you're listening. I said, Ange, I got to figure something out. I'm, yeah, I'm killing it for you guys at work, but I'm, I'm not happy at home. I'm not, I'm stressed out. I'm not, and I, I go, I got to figure something out. And she's like, well, it's, what, what do you want to do? I'm like, I don't know. I, she's like, why don't you leave it four every day? I'm like, this isn't a bank. I can't do that. She's like, why can't you? And so I had like about an hour long commute, 45 minute commute. And I literally would leave it for no matter what. Wow. And, and I drove home and if there was stuff that needed to be, get a hold of that I'd, I'd be, which, which goes back to why I was so regimented and planned because I maximized the, you know, what out of each minute of that day, because sure. if I didn't, I was sacrificing what my time to be at home with family. So I, I did that. And then from, from five to seven though, I would be unavailable. You know, and the last time I checked, my phone number is not 911. I'm not that important. We think we are. And I would have dinner with the family. I'd, I'd do bath time. I'd hang out. And then at 7 45, I'd get back online and clean up what I missed, document for the day, hang out with my wife. We'd watch show. You know, I'd be kind of multitasking a little bit on the couch. And it taught me also that it's not about me. And so not only did I have balance in a home, now I became better balanced at home at work because I had to rely on my recruiting team. And I, I stopped being the bottleneck. I got them, all the recruiters in front of the clients. And so they were working directly with, with not my clients, our clients, because I didn't own them. K-Force owned them, which most staffing people, that's like unheard of. Why would I do that? I'm the account manager and they only want to talk to me. Bull S, that's in your mind, bro, or sister. <laughs> you know? <laughs> Absolutely. And yes. now all of a sudden, my team liked me more because I was bound, more balanced with them. And so in the end, it was my, once I did that, Pete, my career really took off because I was a better mental state. I was still exercising. I was focused at work. And I don't know, that's on my heart when you ask me that question. So that's how I'd answer it. That makes a lot of sense. And, and I appreciate that answer for sure. And, and I know it's a struggle for a lot of people um, to find where the right balance is. You know, we mm -hmm. all want it, of course. We want it all. Who doesn't? Um, sometimes it does require sacrifice. Um, sometimes that should be temporary, right? It doesn't mm -hmm. have to be permanent, but ultimately, uh, you know, it sounds like you found 
the ballot. So is it safe to say, and this is a question that I ask everyone because of the nature of this podcast, have you found career zen? I think I have, to be honest with you. I am doing what I was meant to do. Um, I, you know, I, I, I giggle. I don't mean to poke fun at the 26-year-old life coach, but I hate to break it. You're not ready to be a life coach. You're 26 years old. <laughs> right? So I, my coaching found me. And I am, everything I teach is through my own personal failure or a few years of success. I'm not up here on a pedestal telling you how great I'm, I'm literally coaching through experience and um, to give away and to kind of teach this win the relationship, not the deal mindset, to, to teach this boomerang mindset that I've created, to teach that my acronym value, um, it's so rewarding and so inspiring. And um, I'm very, very thankful that I'm in a spot. I'm very grateful for all the years of K-Force, all the leaders that kind of taught me things. And now I'm in a spot where I could give it away. And um, I'm, I'm, I'm waking up inspired and it, it's the best, best feeling ever. There, there is no better feeling. And, and that is, uh, that sh- should probably be everyone's goal uh, to no matter how they find it, no matter what it is for them. But if you can say you wake up every morning you know, excited and inspired, um, it quite literally doesn't get any better than that. I don't think. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so. no, I'm very, I'm very lucky. And, you know, I mean, nothing's forever. You never know how long I'll do this, but I can tell you right now it's, I'm, I'm loving it. Um, it's when you can get people to really, like I said, embrace those three words, humility, unlock their humility, unlock their vulnerability, make, help them be more curious and watch them do those things and get wins. They're like, this was like, not that difficult. I'm like, I know that's called life. We overcomplicate things. Yes, we do. Well, man, something tell we haven't known each other that long, but something tells me, uh, you, you're never going to be content to sit still for very long. So, uh, you're doing a lot right now. Um, you know, you have an outstanding podcast. Thank you. Um, you know, you're coaching. Do you have another book planned yet? Um, in my mind I do, but it's not, I'm not ready to commit to it, but I, if I had to guess, it would be about those three words. Okay. Humility, well, vulnerability, curiosity. Well, we're going to, we're going to, we're going to look forward to that one. I, I think you should, you should do it. I mean, you have a lot to offer Casey and I mean that in the most sincere way. And, um, Appreciate it. that's, that is why I asked you to come on because, you know, not everyone has found careers in and most probably say they, they haven't. And, um, but it's not, I don't, I believe that the opportunities to find it is, have mm-hmm. never been better. I think technology, the changing world, the virtual world has enabled um, so many opportunities for us, for those who uh, seek it out, which is a key component, right? It's not going to come to you necessarily. You, you have to work, work for it, but you've, you've put in that work and you've earned it. So, um, you know, that, 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 that's meaningful, um, in a very significant way. Awesome. So man, uh, we'll list all your stuff. Thank you so much. And, um, everyone who's, who's listened, have a great rest of your day and we will talk to you very soon. Casey, thanks again. Thank you, Pete.